guide you towards the yes button on the screen so that you can show that you are here by selecting the yes. And if you're struggling to find the yes, just be patient. It'll be there. Any, 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 three, two, one. Ah. I <laughs> is there anybody present whose jurisdiction is not showing up? I, I just closed it. We got enough. 17 okay. yeses. Thank you. And now I'd ask that you uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance by standing, and I'll ask uh, Councilman Tisdale to lead us, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me as we honor our nation's flag. Again, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Janice, do we have any requests to speak other than the one you gave me? No, sir. Arnold, are you hiding? There you are. We're going to start just adding you to our agenda. I, I would suggest that we put you down at the bottom. That would be too much work. Don't do that. <laughs> How are you? Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Just wanted to bring up a couple of reminders of what's going on right now. So we are doing our Connect SoCal workshops. We're taking input from everybody on if you want something in the long-range regional transportation plan and sustainable community strategy, this is the time to tell staff this is what I want to see in the plan. So we're doing workshops in this nearby area, June 5th, 9 a.m. at the historic Santa Fe Depot in San Bernardino, next Tuesday, June 11th at the Skag Riverside office right across the street, and then June 11th at 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. at the Corona Public Library. So uh, come out and join us for that if you can. And then for free for all elected officials is our demographic summit. Make it count the impact of the census 2020 and connect SoCal on our future. That's Tuesday, also June 11th, all day 830 to 330 at the USC School of Public Policy. And you can do that by Metrolink and by rail. You don't have to drive. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you, Arnold. Next item is minutes, uh, item number four minutes from May 6th. And unless there are uh, any requests to pull any of those items or pull that item for comments rather, um, I'll accept a motion to approve the minutes as is. You want me to end the vote, Janice? Actually, Mr. Chair, um, the agenda that I am seeing in the system is not the agenda uh, that we have presented in front of you. Oh. We're going to check with um, IT. Okay. Well, in any case, the minutes are approved on a 16 <laughs> uh, 16-0 vote. <laughs> And I'm sure that that's what everybody intended to vote on the May 6th minutes. Is there anyone here that would like to change their vote on the minutes? And everyone knows we were voting on May 6th minutes. Okay, we're good. And while they're working on those technical issues, the next item is consent calendar and it's 5A through 5L, I, um, 
I've got L. L? Yeah. Are there any requests to pull any of those items for comments or suggestions? Is everyone comfortable that they're looking at the correct agenda? If so. The PowerPoint is displayed on the screen, so everybody should be able to also see that. Okay. Please register your vote on the consent calendar. That one's wrong. But you got a vote. So are they um, still working on getting the correct agenda up there? I'll check with Patrick or Paul when he comes back. I don't know if they need to do a restart of the system because it shows at the top of my screen here that they've opened the agenda for May 6th, not today. Dang. <laughs> well, from where I'm sitting, it looks like the consent calendar was approved. Uh, 17 to 1, but it does show that there's only nine items, which is not correct, obviously. Correct. So what I will do is take the votes that were being recognized here today. When I prepare the minutes, it will have the accurate items. Okay. Who was the one abstention? District 5. Okay. So. You can't see the agenda, sir? You don't or, have or the PowerPoint? Do you have a hard copy? Oh. The PowerPoint looks correct. Yes, sir. All right. Anybody want to change their vote? Okay. All right. So we have 18 yes. Thank you, sir. Zero no's, zero abstention. That moves us down to reports and discussions. Uh, the first item on that uh, is 6A, report from League of California Cities, Aaron Sassy. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here today. Aaron Sassy with the League of California Cities. Uh, last week was the deadline for bills to be heard in their house of origin. So we had some good and bad things happen, mostly bad, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of the items for you. Um, one thing before I go into the legislative item, I know in the past I've brought up that CalPERS had an agenda item at their June meeting to make the Fuller case a precedential decision, which basically would have been um, making it very difficult for all of you to contract for employees. Uh, that agenda item has been pulled. We don't think it's coming back at this point, so that is very good news. So we can all breathe a little easier on that. So thank you for all of those of you that helped with that. Um, the governor's budget still has the trailer bill that ties housing production to transportation. There is no appetite for this in the legislature, so we do believe it's going to be removed. I think they're looking at alternatives. Um, they want to still have some sort of accountability for cities not reaching, not reaching their housing production goals, but I don't think it will end up being transportation. I just don't know what it will be at this point. Uh, one good item which happened is that SB 50 was killed. Unfortunately, there's an assembly bill that has a lot of similar components that did make it out of the assembly. It's AB 20, or sorry, AB 1279 by Bloom. Um, I think that there's going to be a little bit of a political battle with this because it took a lot of effort to kill SB 50, and now that this one's very similar, not really sure what's going to happen, but you should all be watching that one. Um, the one difference is that it would likely apply to all cities. There's not a lot of defined definitions in the bill, but the, word, the way we're looking at it is that every city would likely qualify for that. So um, please pay attention. It's AB 1279 by Bloom. It has to do with high resource areas, and that did make it into the Senate. 
Another bill is SB 330. This is the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. It also made it out of the Senate and is now in the Assembly. So this puts a moratorium on all of you for five years from imposing parking requirements. Um, it freezes fees and charges. Um, pretty bad for all of you, so you probably want to get some letters in on that. Another bill that I've brought up in the past is AB 849 by Bonta. This has to do with your redistricting process. It also made it out of the Assembly and is now in the Senate. Basically, this has been amended, but it would still require four different public hearings, one to be held on either a weekend or after 6 p.m., um, regardless of your population size, and it re requires you to do live translation services for all applicable language languages when you're doing your redistricting process. So. Um, it's going to be very difficult for all of you. You should be getting your letters in on that. Another bill that I know a lot of you have been sending in letters recently is AB 516 by Chu. This one made it out of the Assembly and is also in the Senate. Um, this basically eliminates your ability for, to uh, enforce your vehicle violations. So. This one, we really need phone calls made to all of our senators, so Senator Roth, Senator Stone, Senator Morell. It's likely going to be heard next week, so tight timeline for you to get letters in, but you need to at least get some calls in to the senators, so uh, we really need to work on that one. One other positive item is AB 1356. This is the Ting bill that had to do with cannabis. It is now dead for the year. I think it will likely come back in the future, but thank you to all of you that did letters, phone calls. It did not make it out of the assembly, so definitely good news. Um, probably the only piece of good news I have left, so sorry about that. Uh, AB 392 Weber is the deadly force bill. It also made it out and is now in the Senate. Um, I know we've been working with the police chiefs on this. Really bad bill. If you haven't sent in a letter, if you haven't made phone calls, please do so. I mean, this is a really difficult bill to battle, but it really is going to tie the hands of our law enforcement community. So get your letters in. Um, SB5, oh, sorry, one other positive. SB5, which is the Senate bill that would bring back a form of redevelopment, did also make it out. Um, it sounds like that is going to be at the vehicle this year. AB11 didn't proceed. So SB5 is the redevelopment bill. Um, so if you haven't supported that, we'd like to encourage you to do so. Uh, one other bill, it's AB1112. It did make it out of the Assembly and is in the Senate. Um, this would eliminate your ability to regulate the motorized scooters. So uh, you might want to look at that if you th are considering having scooters within your city or even if you're not because um, it would kind of take away your local control for that. So. Please get your letters in. Uh, there's going to be a lot of action in the next couple of weeks before they go on recess. Um, but thank you for everything you've already been doing at this point, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions for Aaron? Seems like there's been a real assault on uh, local control. Yes. City of Hemet. I don't have a question. I just have a comment to make. I'm right in front of you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, who's talking? <laughs> I just want to thank you for that comprehensive report. Thank you. That It was really, really helpful to have them all in front of us uh, like that. So thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. There's a lot more bills on there that I did not address. So I, I realize that. Too. And thank you for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to keep you here all day. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Okay, um, we've come to a branch in the agenda. They're telling me that the only way to get the correct agenda on your screen is to reboot and then re-sign every seat back into the system. That's going to be a while. The other option would be um, on the PowerPoint. Is that correct, Janice? We are displaying the correct agenda as well as, is there anyone that doesn't have a hard copy or a digital copy in front of them that they can use? Because I'd rather not shut down the whole system to go through that again. And I can do voice votes if that's what you need. Well, everybody that's here is registered. We can still do electronic votes. Just know that it's not matched with the item. I, I'm not sure how you're seeing it on your screen, but my screen, it's, this is last month's agenda. Yeah. That's what they're saying, other than the PowerPoint. So if you select the camera uh, button, you will see the PowerPoint. If you select the gavel, you'll see the agenda that's on the screen, but it's last month's agenda. Is everybody clear on that? 
So, so we can we can keep it on the PowerPoint the entire time. Okay, because the other one's worthless anyway. Yeah. So. Yes, sir. All right, great. The next item then is um, item six B, town program updates. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Daniel Ramirez Cornejo, Program Manager in the Transportation and Planning Department at WRCOG, and today I'll be providing an update on a few um, TUMF program activities. By way of background, the TUMF is a regional mitigation fee assessed on new development for transportation um, improvements in the WRCOG subregion. So I'll begin um, with the recap of TUMF collections through March 2019. Approximately 45 million um, in TUMF has been collected with three months left of collection reporting in the fiscal year. Staff is anticipating that, fiscal, uh, that revenues for fiscal year 1819 will exceed the 53 million collected in fiscal year 1718. Single family residential uh, collections continue to be the largest contributor of the TUMF revenues at about 51%. This is followed by the industrial land use, um, which is 21% of the total collected through March, or approximately 10 million. We would like to note that multifamily TUMF collections have more than doubled that of fiscal year 1718. Um, in the past couple of months, we've had major uh, multifamily development projects pay TUMF in the city of Riverside and the city of Menifee. Here we have TUMF revenue broken down by zone. The Northwest, Southwest, and Central zones are the major contributors to the TUMF collections at about 90% of, of the total. However, we have seen increases in TUMF collections for both the Hemis San Jacinto and PASS zones. Um, the PASS zone revenue has already exceeded that of fiscal year 1718, which is about 2 million. I'll now move on to the TUMF calculation and collection policy that was approved, uh, the policy revision that was approved by the Executive Committee in October of 2018. The revision allowed member agencies the option to delegate the fee collection responsibility to WRCOG. Uh, member agencies that wished to delegate the fee responsibility, uh, the fee collection responsibility to WRCOG must approve a TUMF ordinance amendment. 16 of the 20 TUMF participating agencies have notified WRCOG of their intention to delegate the, um, the responsibility to WRCOG, and they are in the process of approving the TUMF ordinance amendment. These 16 member agencies that have indicated the change in the process um, represent approximately 80% of all the TUMF collections. The cities of Beaumont, Lake Elsinore, Paris, and the County of Riverside have notified WRCOG that they will maintain the, um, the previous process and will continue remitting TUMF to WRCOG on a monthly basis. And annually, WRCOG will follow up with each agency to confirm that status that they, um, of who is responsible for collecting and calculating the TUMF. Since TUMF collections began by WRCOG in March, um, WRCOG has collected more than four million in TUMF. The way the process has been working is that member agency staff submit calculation requests to WRCOG for staff to review. WRCOG make the fee, ca uh, fee calculations and submit the TUMF obligation for specific projects to both the developer and the member agency. In general, this um, turnaround time has been within the hour of receiving the request from member agency staff. And on a monthly basis, staff is distributing reports to each of those agencies with the TUMF calculations and the collections made for the month. We would note that most of the TUMF collections that WRCOG has made to date have been made electronically. And with that, we are working with Viewpoint Government Solutions to develop an online fee portal for member agencies to submit the calculation requests and for developers to make their TUMF payments. We would expect that the uh, project will be completed by August, and as major milestones are completed, we'll be bringing back updates to the committee structure um, for review. The last two items on, um, as, as part of the staff report are TUMF reimbursement agreements. The first reimbursement agreement is with the City of Eastvale for the Limonite Avenue extension, which will include a bridge over the Cucamonga Creek. The reimbursement agreement is in the amount of 1.5 million and is for the planning and engineering phases of the, of the project. The second reimbursement agreement is with the City of Menifee, and it is for the Scott Road widening project. 
The reimbursement agreement is in the amount of $2.3 million, and it is for the planning and engineering phases of the work. The Scott Road widening will ultimately tie into the Scott Road interchange, which is currently under construction. With that, Mr. Chair, that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Other questions regarding the town program updates? City of Menifee. Daniel? Yes. Are developers able to contact WR COG and get fee calculations, or are they strictly to go through the cities? For fee estimates, they can, they can contact WR COG. We did last fall develop a um, fee estimator tool that can be accessed through our website, and we've been directing uh, most of the developers to that tool. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Uh, the requested action for this item is to authorize the executive director to execute a TUMP reimbursement agreement with uh, the city of Eastvale, planning and engineering phases of Limonite, authorize the executive direct director to execute a TUMP re reimbursement agreement with the city of Menifee for planning and engineering, Scott Road, an amount not to exceed $2.3 million. Are there any other questions? Can I get a motion? Can you open? Motion to approve. Yes. Okay. Push, 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 push the button. And vote. All right. That motion is approved with 16 yes votes, zero no votes, and two abstentions. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is 6C, Tom Fee Calculation Handbook Updates, Christopher Gray. Good morning, members of the committee. Christopher Gray, Director of Transportation Planning for WR Cog, and I'm here to tell you, talk to you on another TUMP item. Uh, this one is even more exciting than the last one. So um, we're here to tell you about a, a minor adjustment we're making in the calculation process for industrial uses. Um, when we go back to the, the dawn of time, back when TUMF was calculated on granite tablets, uh, originally TUMF had a single, had a single industrial category. Um, so any kind of industrial, whether it's a warehouse, a factory, anything like that, was a single fee, single category. Um, in the mid-2000s, it was brought to our attention that there's a new type of warehouse, which was called a high cube. Um, and what's unique about a high cube is it has very low, uh, relatively low levels of employment. Um, these are those warehouses that have uh, big giant doors, and it's basically for uh, loading and unloading of trucks. So we said, hey, um, this is something that is, needs to be studied further. We, we uh, looked at available data, conducted a study, and we said, you know, this uh, use needs its own fee calculation. Well, fast forward to today, we're now seeing yet another type of use, which are really these fulfillment and distribution centers. Um, this is associated with e-commerce, and these are related to uh, facilities that take packages, separate them out, um, and these packages then get delivered to you. So we were um, asked to look into whether we needed a separate fee calculation for this use as well. And uh, what I wanted to show you is it's pretty obvious to figure out what these types of uses are. So if you look at this aerial photo, you'll see that this is an industrial building that is about 10 years old. There's very limited parking at the top and the bottom. There's actually quite a bit of truck storage and loading areas. Um, when we go to other facilities, the um, passenger car and the employee parking has increased significantly. So these facilities have a lot more employees working at them than, than the high cube warehouses uh, we had studied previously. So we had also gotten a, a request from Riverside County District 1 to specifically look at the impacts of industrial land uses, and we had a number of other stakeholders that asked us to look at um, are we addressing industrial uses in an equitable fashion. Uh, we uh, really gave ourselves two questions to answer. One, do these fulfillment and distribution centers generate more traffic than a typical high cube warehouse? And secondly, is it enough of a difference or is there a reason for us to give them their own fee calculation category? Uh, so we went out and being uh, good traffic folks, we collected a bunch of data. We went to some existing studies and found out we didn't have a lot of really great data that was local. So we went out and did traffic counts at 16 facilities. Uh, and we picked those facilities by talking to staff at the city of Eastville, Yupa Valley, Moreno Valley, Paris, and um, Riverside to help us identify and facilitate those counts. 
Um, we collected 72 hour counts at these 16 sites and we made sure to follow all the protocols for data collection. What we found, surprising to us, is that these facilities don't actually generate more truck trips than a typical use, but they do generate a lot more activity, and that activity occurs in terms of passenger cars. What has happened, and no one ever projected this, is one, they have a lot of employees working in these facilities, and two, they're asking their employees to both work there and make deliveries. So in fact, um, it used to be that packages were delivered by trucks, now pass tra packages are being delivered by passenger vehicles. In fact, there's a mom in my neighborhood who drives around a minivan and has her daughter deliver Amazon packages um, for us. So what we're finding is, yes, these facilities do generate a lot more vehicular traffic, primarily automobiles, than typical warehouses. So to answer our question, yes, they do generate more traffic. It justifies a change in how the calculation is done. But there isn't enough separation to require that there's a new category. Part of the challenge, too, is, and in, our jurisdictions have told us a number of times they don't actually know what kind of warehouse is being built, so I don't know if it's a regular warehouse or a high cube warehouse or um, a fulfillment and distribution center, and sometimes the use changes over time, so we felt it was better to simply be um, to adjust the how the calculation is done. Um, the findings were presented at the Public Works Committee. Um, the actual impact of this fee is relatively nominal, so for a a uh, large high queue warehouse that will pay about an extra $56,000 in fees, 7% of the total TUMP fees. Uh, the impact of this development is the cost to build one of these buildings from start to finish is about $130 a square foot, which means if you're building a million dollar, I'm sorry, a million square foot distribution center, you're spending about $130 million. It's about a 0.05% uh, increase in the total project cost. Um, and so we were then asked when we discussed this with our city managers to do a more in-depth study on where traffic from one of these facilities go. The idea is perhaps they're all local trips. Uh, and that's actually not true. Uh, so we collected um, origin destination data from by tracking people's cell phones. I can give you a whole tangent on that. Uh, but this is where trips from an Amazon facility in Moreno Valley are going. They're traveling all over the region. So what we found is that these types of uh, distribution centers really are regional uh, facilities, and therefore it justified uh, imposing a higher TUMF fee on them. Uh, and then finally, we also have found out that in many cases they are being built on TUMF facilities or being built on major regional arterials, further justifying uh, a higher fee level. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, we have two requested actions. One is to approve our new calculation process for warehouses based on this data. And then at a request of the city managers, we've been asked to come back in two years and revisit this because we're also mindful that technology is changing, land uses are changing. In two years, it may be um, that these travel patterns of these facilities have changed. Therefore, we're, we're going to come back to you in 24 months. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. Are there any questions for Mr. Gray? Seeing none. Oh, City of Moreno Valley. That's mine. Okay. Would these um, increases take effect immediately, or is there an implementation date? No, they would take effect. Um, they would take effect following approval of our executive committee. Okay. So projects that are already being um, built would be surprised by another fee. No, it, 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 the fees are due when either the building permit is issued or the certificate of occupancy is issued. So if they've already been issued building permits, no additional fees would be due. However, if they're, when they come in to pay their fees, they would pay the fees at this higher level. Okay. Well, being that we have building going on in Myrtle Valley, I would like to see uh, implementation date in the future so that they're not surprised by new fees. So my, my answer to that is uh, if you wish to make a motion, certainly that's the case. However, um, what we have done on these minor uh, fee calculation issues is it takes effect once the executive committee takes action. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm clear on what the request is from the city of Moreno Valley. Um, the fees that are applied and calculated for Tom, they're the same for every city. Correct. Um, so, so, so as of tomorrow, if you if you are building one of these facilities and you come in, you would pay the 
the slightly higher fee. Keep in mind that for a million square foot warehouse, you're paying about a million dollars, you're paying close to a million dollars in fees, and just in tump fees. So you, we would ask you to, at the most, to pay another $50,000. <clears> okay. City of Beaumont. Um, will, will this require, this won't require an adjustment to a resolution, a local resolution or a local ordinance, will it? No, in order well, it, for it, to be effective? It will not because there's language in the ordinance that says all fees are calculated based on, based per the fee calculation handbook. So when we make these changes in the fee calculation handbook, that's why they take effect immediately and there's no ordinance or further action needed by the city. Okay, and then one other question related to that. You know, when you start looking at fast food restaurants that where we took into consideration vehicles driving in to the restaurant, obviously. Uh, are we going to be having to look at those fast food restaurants now that deliver food instead of, so now you have trips going both ways, which seems to be a real popular item now is so Grubhub and all the other delivery food locations, restaurants deliver now. If, if one or more of our agencies request that we do that or it becomes an issue, um, we are always uh, open to look at new land or changes in land use types. So for example, the city of Corona came to us and said, we're building a number of senior housing. We think senior housing should be charged less of a trip, less of a fee than standard housing. So we went out, did a study, made the adjustment. So as folks have brought new land uses or changes in land use to us, we have made those uh, changes. So if one or more of our member agencies were to ask us that question, we would go out and study it, we would collect the data and determine whether that's correct or not. Thank you. City of Banning. For clarification purposes, the projects that have already been approved, they will not fall into that fee adjustment or it, will they? So it depends if the fees have been paid. So if you've, let's say, approved a warehouse, mm -hmm. that warehouse has gone to your city and requested its building permits and paid all of its fees, we would not impose additional fees. However, most developers pay their fees at the absolute last minute. So they, they are literally paying their fee um, like a, a week before they open. So it's likely that if, someone's, if something's been approved and it's under construction now, they have not paid all of their fees. I but see. that would just depend on the, uh, each individual project. So basically all the fees that we have given them that would be due at a certain date, now they have additional fees. That's correct. Most cities, when they tell them their fees, uh, they're very clear that this is an estimate and then final fees are due at the time uh, of the permits, permits are being issued. Understood. Supervisor Hewitt. Yeah, I, um, I have a problem with moving the goalposts back after a permit's already been issued and such like that. And like you say, Chris, um, a lot of times, uh, sometimes they're paid up front when they issue the permit, but most of the time they're paid at the end. I don't like, you know, there is a, su such a point, we're talking only about 0.05% or 48000 on a $1 million fee or something like that. But nevertheless, there's an old parable about a camel whose back was broken by a straw, which was a heck of a lot less than 0.05% of the total weight. Um, yeah, I, 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 that's why I'll be voting no on this. I, I have a problem with doing that afterwards. I, if we could change it to any project that's already been issued permits and they know what their costs are ahead of time and such, then um, that we shouldn't be changing on Something coming forward after that, I still don't like keeping in more and more fees, but I, I would probably be able to live with that, but I won't be doing it with this. Chris, just for point of clarification, uh, in answer to the previous uh, speaker, didn't you say that the fees, um, I, I, I thought I understood you to say that if they had not paid their fees prior to pulling permits, that they would pay their fees when pulling permits, right. what's, what's there's very, no yeah. situation where they're paying their fees after getting permits. Is that are, are we talking about different kinds of permits? Yeah, it's there. There are different kinds of permits. So what most developers a, a on the non-residential side, the CFO? yeah, okay. most um, 
What most developers on the non-residential side will do is they will pull a building permit which allows them to do grading and construction and they will pay some of their fees at that point. So for example, some fees are due at grading. Uh, I think RCA and some of the habitat fees are due at grading. Um, a number of the water districts require payment of fees at that point. What they will then come do is they will hold off on paying any more fees until they absolutely have to, till they get their certificate of occupancy. Usually they know their tenants and it's part of the, the leasing process. At that point, they will generally pay all of their fees. And the fees are calculated at that point of what the fees are due at that point because sometimes the city fees will change, sometimes other agency fees will change, um, and that's why all developers are told this is a fee estimate, this is not a binding uh, fee that you have to pay. This is our estimate on your fees. And so for large complex projects, they're usually recalculating the fees at multiple points during the process. Um, so to that end, if anyone has paid their fees, they would pay no more fees. But if anyone has not paid all of their fees, the new fee would kick in. Okay, uh, City of Riverside. I just have a workaround for this to potentially um, have the supervisors vote on, on this item. How long would it take staff to notify any, everybody in the process that their the intent is to give them the ability to pay their fee under the, the current structure, fee structure? So if we, if we have a date certain, 60, 90 days, could staff notify everybody that is in the process that this is the date the new fees will be imposed. So it gives them the control, the me a mechanism at least, and we're responsive to these individuals in the process so they're not surprised. So what, what would that look like? So a couple of options is sometimes our fee changes take effect on the fiscal year. So for example, we have an adjustment that's already been adopted by ordinance to adjust the single family fee by $300 as of July 1st. So one option would be to say it takes effect on the fiscal year. Another option would be to push it back. Um, uh, we could do, I would recommend instead of 30, 60 days since it's June 3rd, we would do a July 1st, August 1st date and that would then allow folks that are currently developing. Um, I would say that there's a substantial amount of industrial development currently in, in the pipeline at various points. Um, so that would give us sufficient time, I think, to notify all the jurisdictions. Uh, and I would also add that, as Daniel pointed out, we're collecting fees for 80% of the projects currently, so we're actually the ones telling people what the fees are, and we're the ones notifying folks of what their fees. So but, I think- but, we, but you still haven't notified them that there could be an increase correct. because it's hadn't been voted on. So I mean, I think that's the concern of the individuals that, are the, that represent the cities. So, so that could be a motion from um, somebody at the dais to you said you said 60 days from from now would give you the or August 1st would give you the ability to notify anybody that after that date if they pull a permit that would that's when the fee would be imposed. Yeah, that would certainly would give us more than sufficient time to notify because we would first notify all of our jurisdictions. We would change our materials. Um, we would put out. Um, e-blasts, we would change our website, we would use all our usual notification channels. We also work closely with NAOP to, to let them know uh, regarding uh, changes in the fees. They commented on our study, they reviewed our study, um, they provided us with, uh, we consulted with them on, on the data we were collecting and, and uh, how we were collecting the data, so we certainly would use them as a mechanism to get the word out as well. I, I think the mayor is suggesting that it goes beyond just notifying them, but actually giving them time um, to gather perhaps some financial resources to pay the fee at the lower rate. Uh, and yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. reading into what he's saying. But right, so, so if you were to delay implementation to let's say August 1st, that would give a majority of the developers it, almost 90 days to, 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 to change the fee. We would tell them what the fee level is, um, it would August. give them the opportunity and we would also concurrently with that say, you know, if you started construction but haven't paid all your fees, you could go, you have the option to pay your tunk yeah, fees right now. July. Yeah. Your math is fuzzy. Well, I would say if August we did. August first isn't I'm sorry. days, yeah. But. Yeah. Okay. 
city of Calamesa. No? City of Norco. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to be unpopular. Um, <clears throat> Uh, given that I know how the fee structure works, um, they expect things can go up and they can go down. And one of the things that I'm concerned about is that this is a way to mitigate impacts. And as a city that has fought against these large buildings, um, we suffer the impacts nevertheless. And that's really what this is about, is trying to find ways to create projects from these fees so that your neighbors, and more importantly, the people are not impacted. And so while I understand giving the developers a break, these are projects that are going to last for decades. Anybody who travels on the 60 freeway or the 10 freeway to Los Angeles is meeting many communities' trucks, even though they have fought against those things. I'm not saying they're good or they're bad, except that this is to mitigate issues. And so I personally think that this is something that we're trying to address, something that's happening right now. And to be fair, uh, they already know that these fees may go up. So I would support, as you recommended, that it immediately goes into effect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. City of San Jacinto. I'm not used to hitting that button on the other side, so Calamesa really isn't here. <laughs> oh. I'm like, why isn't well, it going stop on? stop pushing their buttons. No. <laughs> That's why, you know, if Larry had been here, we wouldn't have the problem. Um, so my question is, haven't we raised fees before? Mm -hmm. Yes. And have we done it midstream? So we, we uh, almost, in, in the time I've been here, we will regularly make small changes in the calculation, how the fees are calculated. Um, we have done comprehensive, ne we did one comprehensive nexus study update, but we have uh, at various times, for example, changed how we calculate the retail fee. Um, we have done, I think, based on my recollection, two or three of these minor fee changes, because what happens is, is no one else fee changes. It's just, it's one, it's one type of use. It just so happens that there's a lot of this occurring right now. So yes, we, we do change the fees. Um, when we have done comprehensive updates, they tend to be tied to um, uh, our fiscal years. The fee takes effect as of July 1st. So why hasn't this been an issue then before? I don't know the extent to it that it has been an issue. Our, our analysis has showed that the, um, given particularly for these projects, given the magnitude of their overall costs, the change in the TUM fee is relatively nominal. Um, and uh, I don't know if it has been a uh, issue. I will say that uh, as part of our fee collection process, now that we're collecting the fees, we have had people come to us and say, I don't know what this TUM fee is. Why, why, I don't even think I should even pay it. And we say, well, the TUM has been around since 2003, and then everyone ends up paying their fees. So. Uh, to the extent to which this is a significant issue, uh, we don't believe it is. We would not, if we had thought it was necessary to bring forward a delay period, we would have recommended one. Uh, however, I would say it's a minor change in the fee, and if you feel it's appropriate to have a delay, uh, staff would be happy to implement that. And whether it's 60 or 90 days, yes, Supervisor Washington, my math is incorrect. Uh, September 1st would roughly be 90 days. But see, that's, that's my question, is why is it all of a sudden a problem because it seems like we're trying to give a deal to someone over other people that haven't had that deal. They haven't had the opportunity to hold that fee off and so I just don't understand why we're trying to do it now. I don't, it doesn't affect us either way. We don't have those types of warehouses in our, our city but it, it, it is a question as to are we going to do this each time or you know, is this really that big of a problem? Yeah, I would say we did defer the increase in residential fees for two years. So when mm -hmm. we, when you approved the Nexus study, we, we had a two-year delay mm -hmm. for the increase in 
uh, the residential fees. Right. So, so we have we have done it before. Whether it's problematic or not, it, it's I, I would say that uh, that would be a matter of opinion. I, I feel compelled to just interject. The purpose of the fee is to mitigate the impact of development. Um, when we initiated the TOMP program, there were at least a couple of economists who said that if we didn't address um, infrastructure and congestion, we would choke on our own traffic. So most of us then have gone along with the TOMP program, recognizing that we do need to support our infrastructure. Then once we establish the TOMP program, changes to it can't just be done arbitrarily. They have to be supported by a study, is that correct? That's correct. So when we do make those changes, um, or if a study is done that justifies an increase and we don't implement the increase, then it, that's a political decision on our part. And as a result of that political decision, then those projects that are on the list to get funded just are going to take longer to get funded. Correct. Because we won't have enough money. We've actually never had enough money right from the beginning of the TUNC program. So that, that's not an editorial about whether you want the TUNC program or not, but I, I think it's important to note that um, we have frequently had this debate about whether to fund increases or not or request increases. And right now, do you have off the top of your head what percentage our TUNC projects are actually funded in terms of, I know it's not 100%. Is it 93%? So I would just say that we've done, periodically done analyses of some of the decisions that have been made during the course of the program. So um, as you may know, there was, an, there was a decision made at the beginning of the program to say, um, we're going to allow certain developers to be exempt from top of the added development agreement. We think that cost the program about $100 million. And so far we've collected about $800 million. Um, we went through a process where we allowed some of you to decrease your fees to 50%. That cost the program about 20 or $30 million. Um, within the grand scheme of things, this whether this increase goes in or it goes in now or it's delayed, it's, it's going to have a nominal effect on the program. But I would say there isn't a single TUMF project that doesn't need more money. Um, we have a handful that are under construction right now that have adequate funding, but it's because the agency was able to bring other funding sources to that project um, or get outside funding or get funding from the state or funding from a local DIF. Um, it seems like everyone needs more money, and that's you know one of our challenges we face is we sometimes have to say no when someone comes to us and says, well, I need $5 million. Well, you know, it's it is a good time for us now in the TUMP program, but you know, revenues are going up, but costs are going up as well. Supervisor Hewitt, I think we're getting a little bit off the thing. Uh, this isn't this doesn't have anything to do with any other delays or anything. This is basically just to address, you know, people that have already come in there. You know, we've told them this is what your fees are going to be. Oh, but don't worry, they could be a lot more. Um, I would make the substitute motion or the amended motion, I, I would be probably a better way to put it, that we keep this the same except for anybody that has already pulled their permits and, and is in the process of doing that. Then we can, um, we can extend that 60 days for them to go ahead at their choice if they want to go ahead and save some money and pay that before that because that's what they were told when they came in and they applied for the permit and got it. It would only affect those, but it's evidently quite a few in the cities of Beaumont, cities of Moreno Valley, many others, many in my own district, and show that we're, we're trying to at least say, hey, here's what's going to cost. We can make up those impacts like, um, like Councilman Bash has said, you know, on, on later ones where I don't like changing the goalpost during it. So I'll make that motion that we keep it the same, fees the same, everything else, but give 60 days to, for people who have that, you know, that want to pay that and save some money on that, um, to do that because that's what they were told. Uh, Supervisor, uh, your motion is noted. I have a couple more okay. requests to speak, so I'm going to um, just hold that motion for the time being. 
if you don't mind. Uh, City of Beaumont. Yeah, typically my experience with the fee increases has always been there's been a notification and a time frame in which those fees are going to go up. For example, residential fees will be going up July 1st. There's a notification. Jurisdictions have the opportunity to put signs out and notify customers. The other concern that I have that, that Supervisor Hewitt is referencing is you, the TUMP program does not allow what, what's referred to as prepayment. In other words, you can't pay the fees prior to your permit being issued. However, at the same time, once that permit is issued, you have the ability to pay your fees, and some jurisdictions may even generate an invoice for those fees, and to have that invoice changed two days later or a day later and increase that fee, I don't think is fair to the, to the developer, which could impact the, the county or any other city. The other concern that I have is some software programs have the fees built in, those jurisdictions would need an opportunity to revise their software programs and adjust the calculation because of the fact that we want to make sure that those fees are collected appropriately and correctly, but you won't give those jurisdictions time. So I, I agree with Supervisor Hewitt along with his motion in the 60 days. Thank you. City of Marietta. So going back to the days when we did the TUMP program in the first place, and Chuck had alluded to it, and so did Chris, uh, you, what it boils down to is no matter what we do, it's all about whether we're going to collect that money and mitigate or whether we're, as, an, as a government agency, are going to absorb the costs because everything we do to put off a fee uh, turns into a cost later on. And a perfect example is the developer agreements that Chris was alluding to. 20, or, I'm sorry, 18 years later, uh, we have developer agreements in place. We have uh, entities going in that should be paying $900,000 a piece in TUMF that aren't because of those developer agreements. Nobody envisioned those type of businesses going in that land. So it was just a mechanism for somebody to race in front of the finish line and, and then not have to pay. And then today we're looking for money to build infrastructure and a lot of the money that we should have been collecting for it all along for those very, very in, the the uh, businesses that are impacting and will be impacted, they never collect. They're not paying into the system, and we're not collecting for it. So I I think what we're talking about here is just you know when's the, where's the line? Because there are going to be people that race in front of it, and there's going to be people that wait, and then there are going to be people that complain because they waited too long and they think they should be raced, they should have gotten in front of it. So I think it's more of a, you know, we just have to make a decision and just understand that whatever decision we make, um, what we don't collect, we eat. Uh, we have to figure out how to pay for that. So that's all. That's my comment. Thank you. Um, so uh, there's no one else in the queue to speak, um, and um, Supervisor Hewitt has suggested a motion. Um, the actual requested action, Supervisor Hewitt, is to approve the adjustment to the high cube warehouse component of the TOMF calculation handbook and to direct staff to conduct a review uh, of that data in 24 months. Are you, is your motion to approve staff's recommendation with an implementation 60 days from now? What is the intent of your, the intent of your motion? So again, anybody who hasn't come in and actually, um, sub, you know, submitted plans or something, there, there's no 60 day anything for them. It's people that are in the works right now, instead of us changing it, you know, after they've already, you know, they fit, figured it into their books. You know, we'd have a tough time if things change all the time, even on our books in the county and stuff. So, you know, it's giving them a chance if they want to come in and say, hey, look, you're going to save $50,000 on this if you pay it before August 1st, even though you may not have your certificate of occupancy until later in the year. And it's where it's going to cost you a lot more. So it's it's really kind of given a grace period for those that are already in the, in in the shoot, so to speak, um, to to do. To, to, and that's what I think. It's it's a it's a fairly small. But from what Chris says, there's a lot of them going on right now, and 80% don't do it until the very end. So this could this could affect quite a few, and it, give them a chance. I don't know how many will do it. Some might 
if you say, no, we don't have money right now anyway or something, they'll, they'll be affected later on. But this will give them the chance to, to decide when we make a change that they couldn't foresee. Um, I would anticipate that uh, the detail of what the supervisor just offered could be very problematic to try to roll out, but I, I'm going to ask, uh, ask uh, Mr. DeBond if he could maybe advise us a bit on how we, uh, how we color those two different types of developments, um, one that's already in the process and someone else who's not. Right. So let me try this. Um, uh, we would retain the um, first um, the first requested action, but add to that that any increase in the fee would be delayed for 60 days for any developer which has already pulled a permit but has not yet paid its fees. Yes. And and I, I would just say that that is very do that is. We have all the information we need to track that. Um, Mike, I think your point is very well taken about certain jurisdictions. You know, for example, the county has a very extensive uh, land development permitting software that, that would give us time to work with them as well. So I think uh, Supervisor Hewitt's uh, motion is very doable for staff. Okay, um, Janice, just for the sake of, I don't know, you better not do that. I was going to say open the motion, but I have a couple more comments. Um, request to speak, and then I'll ask that we open it so that he can make his motion. Norco. So um, I guess I just, to sort of piggyback on what you said, um, I just happen to hold that the impacts to the people are paramount, and that's the whole purpose of this. And I totally get the developers there to make money, create jobs, do all those things. But there will be a cost that's going to be borne, and that's exactly why this is happening. And, um, and then I'm a little bit confused. So if somebody has come in a year ago, paid their permit fees, and they're in the process of development, or let's say like right now we have an industrial project that's been in the queue for three and a half years. So that person can just keep going, or at the end of 30 to 60 days, they would have to pay the new rate. So my interpretation of Supervisor Hewitt's request would be as follows. Um, there would be three categories of projects. First category is a person has submitted, let's say, a plan to the city, and they're in plan check. It hasn't been approved by city council. They have no building permits. They're just, it's a conceptual right. project. Or they, they get entitled. They're entitled. Right. They would pay the higher fee because they have no permits. What the second, the third category would be those who have actually paid all their fees, and they're in the process of finishing up construction. No new fees would be due. The third category are those people who are in the middle, meaning they've come in, they have, they're actually working on their site, maybe they're doing grading, they've, they've pulled their permits, they have permission to build, but they haven't paid all of their fees. So we will come, we will go to them and say, you know, you're gonna pay the fee at the current rate, so if they come in, we'll give them the option of paying their fee at the lower rate, if they have not paid all their fees. That's my interpretation of what the supervisor has asked us to do. Or so, wait. Or wait. Wait 60 days, 90 days. Yes. You can do that. Yes, we can do that. And and there's, as I mentioned earlier, there's different kinds of permits. Correct. So when you say they pulled a permit, you're not, you know, we, we probably need to be clear about our, our interpretation would be they have pulled a, bill mit, a permit to begin construction, so they're actually putting up stuff. That would be my very technical term. Not a grading permit? No. Or? They're, they're, they're actually, I would say, construction, and they're actually putting up stuff. Okay. Harupa Valley. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, I uh, agree with uh, Supervisor Hewitt in what he said. Uh, I would suggest possibly a 90-day instead of a 60-day uh, delay on that uh, fee change. Okay. Um, September 1st is 90 days, yeah. Chris. So is that it? Yes. Okay. Um, Janice, can then you open it so that I'm going to ask Supervisor Hewitt to press the motion button and then also to restate his motion. Yes, sir. And just so you're aware, I've retyped the following items on this, so it, it correctly now reflects what's on the actual agenda. 
Okay. You were doing that while while the meeting was going on? Yes, sir. And listening to everything we were saying? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so, again, Supervisor Hewitt, can you please restate what you hope to gain from this, uh, this motion? Exactly what uh, Mr. Devon said. He, he had such a simple way of saying what I right. took me five minutes. Okay, all right. But all right. we will, uh, okay. it's 60 days. We're at 60 days. No, we're at 90 days. But that would be a, a, another oh. addendum. So my motion is 60. Oh, okay, 60. His motion is 60 days. Okay. And I can restate the motion if that's from. No, yes. no, no, we don't need more. <coughs> we don't need more. Yeah, you got it, Chris. I got it. So that's August 1st. August 1st. All right. Please I register can, your votes. I can agree with that. We do. We have a second by Moreno Valley. Jeez, I'm actually going up. That motion carries with uh, 14 yes votes, two no votes, and two abstentions. Um, Janice, can you display um, the actual vote and, uh, so that everybody knows uh, who voted yes, who voted no, and who abstained? There Do you it is. no longer see it on the screen? Okay. No. Oh, it's the water districts. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. All right. Now we're down to um, the really tough stuff. Nominations for chair, vice chair, and second vice chair. And Mr. Debon, do we have to do all of those separately? I guess that would probably be advised, huh? Or can we just do it all in one? You can do it all at once as long as we don't have voting confusion. But if, it, if the slate is accepted as is, then we can do it all at once. Otherwise, I would recommend doing it separately. I'm going to make the motion and the second. Uh, I don't think you can make a second. <laughs> joke. <laughs> Open it up, Jan. It's, nobody's requesting to speak. Yeah. Quick, let's get the vote out. So while I did retype it, I did not retype this particular one as three separate actions. Uh, it's all one. That's okay. In the interest We're do of it time. All. If somebody objects, they, guaranteed they will let me know. <laughs> All right, this is to uh, approve Bonnie Wright as chair, Kevin Bash as vice chair, and Kelly Ciardo as second vice chair. All in favor, vote. Actually, anybody, vote, whether you're in favor or not, just vote. Wow, it's unanimous. That's great. Yes, yes. All right, Mr. George Johnson, would it be too much of a strain on you to give us a technical advisory report committee? Uh, yeah, I really don't have much to report other than to uh, say I had a little accident over the weekend. And as I was uh, doing some yard work and uh, cleaning up the ease where I had some bird nests in the house that I fell off a ladder and uh, oh. smacked my forehead on a concrete curb. So I spent Saturday night at the emergency room getting stitched up and uh, fortunately I'm back and I'm fine. So, so when I broke my wrist, Hard head. when I broke my wrist snowboarding and I went to the emergency room, they said, and how old are you? <laughs> well, clearly I'm too old to be on a ladder anymore, so I think I learned something this weekend, yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here and safe. Um, reports uh, from committee representatives, and we'll start with um, any of the SCAG representatives who attend Regional Council or Policy Committee. Well, we have the conference, so we yeah, the have separate meetings. Okay. Okay. So nothing to report from anyone. AQMD, Ben Benoit. Uh, no major items to report this time. Calcog, Brian Tisdale. Yes, sir. We had a meeting on Tuesday of last week. Uh, so just a couple things. Um, uh, if you go to cal calcog.org, you can look at what Calcog, what bills they support, their updates, and what positions they take on them. 
Um, there was a lot of talk up there about the housing trailer bill and housing in general. I, I did leave with a positive note, though. The governor is, has an advisor. Her name is Tia Boatman Patterson. She's got a long history. She's a lawyer. I don't know if that's a good thing. That's uh, always. A good thing. <laughs> but she she worked on Wait, Sacramento say that again. housing. I I, he wasn't paying attention. Yes, yeah, Steve so. didn't hear you. And my other favorite <laughs> lawyer out there, she's already left. So okay, it doesn't matter. Um, but she um, so the governor has now taken an approach that it's not a one size fits all for housing, which was very impressive because you know we had certain senators that were trying to force the uh, San Francisco model down our throat. So that was a positive thing. So the governor is actually listening. So that that's very positive. CalCog will keep supporting us and keep pushing local control, and that's a good thing. Uh, they're moving forward with their next leadership academy, which Caltrans has funded $75,000. That's a good thing. And we approved our budget for next year. We did an extension for our uh, executive director. And then the other thing that was positive is the EDs for uh, CSAC and for the League of Cities, they both spoke to us and they're working together on issues and that's always positive when our counties and cities are all working together for a common good. So it was a very positive meeting and we'll have another meeting in three months, uh, November I think. So thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, Mr. Tisdale. SAPA, oh wow, committee. Ms. Mayor Bailey. Yes, indeed, it was a wow moment for me when I was able to recommend $23 million of funding. It only took five years to get there from Prop 1 bond proceeds of 2014, <laughs> uh, but that's government at work for us, right? And there was, there was funding across the board, or first of all, uh, the One Water, One Watershed um, Committee of SAPA is a united voice for the Santa Ana River watershed. And it still is united because OWOW funding, although it was reduced from $23 million to $16.7 million per negotiations with North Orange County because they didn't feel like they were getting enough on previous funding rounds. And so uh, it was a 30% allocation to keep them a part of SAPA. And I, I think that, that that works in our favor to be one water, one watershed, or to call ourselves that, we would, we would have to have Orange County as part of that. So negotiations worked, although the funding decreased a little bit for our neck of the woods, but there was some significant funding that came our way, and I'll, I'll detail those quickly. Uh, Evans Lake Tributary Restoration and Camp Evans Recreation. Actually, four categories in terms of what this funding addresses from the Integrated Regional Water Management Project funding. Uh, it addresses supply, addresses conservation, recreation, and then protection. And one of the recreation and conservation projects in our neck of the woods, again, Evans Lake Tributary Restoration and Camp Evans Recreation, creates recreation and education facilities and aquatic terrestrial habitats near Evans Lake in the city of Riverside, but is a regional draw uh, right up the 60 freeway. Establishes and maintains aquatic habitat restoration for native aquatic species, such as our very own threatened Santa Ana suckerfish. That's, that's true, that's a real word. That's a real, real, real species, Santa Ana sucker. Uh, and also restores habitats and it'll be monitored and maintained in perpetuity. Um, by the Upper Santa Ana River Habitat Conservation Plan, and that was in partnership with San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District. So we are continuing to love our neighbors, thanks to San Bernardino uh, Valley and County coming our way. There's the Santa Ana Mountains water, Watershed uh, Protection Project. This is one of the protection pieces that we, we found out we, well, we, we found out we needed many years ago, but most recently because of the fires and the mudslides. It provides and maintains 60, excuse me, 651 acres of fuel breaks. That's forest fire fuel breaks on National Forest System lands along the crest of the Santa Ana Mountains over the next seven years. So it'll reduce the probability of future wildfire events that negatively impact the soil, water quality, and vegetation. There's also SAPA Regional Comprehensive Landscape Rebate Program. There's the conservation aspect and accelerated leak detection and metering. And then a joint project be between Inland Empire uh, Utility uh, Agency, excuse me, and the Hrupa Community Services District um, on a regional water recycling program. And that's going to create some more supply, 38,000 uh, linear feet of pipe to maximize use of recycled water throughout the Chino Basin, 4,000 acre feet a year, recycled water. 
Um, enhancements to watershed wide water budget decision support tool. <laughs> Develops an urban landscape assessment tool to measure, classify, monitor, and report on landscape water demands for the SAPA. Over 70 retail agencies will be um, benefited by that. And then the last one is is my friends over in Lake Elsinore. I have friends there, right? Yes, sir. Okay. A physical harvesting of algal biomass in Lake Elsinore. Removal of excessive algae growth to attain newly revised total maximum daily loads and improve and maintain the health of the lake. Is that, is that good for you? All right. So that's what we have going on from SAPA. I'm proud to represent you all on Oh Wow. All right. Next is uh, Council Member Ruiz and the SANDAG Borders Committee. Um, it, it's uh, interesting to uh, go down there and, and talk about the border with them because they're not just talking about the, uh, you know, the border with Mexico. Um, one of their main concerns is, is the border with Riverside County. And they're talking about um, an interregional um, park and ride strategy from uh, getting people from Riverside County over to San Diego and how we can alleviate traffic and that kind of thing. So as that progresses and we move forward and, and have all these joint meetings that, that come up, um, I'll be letting you guys know, but that's, that's the main thing about what, what there would affect WR card. All right. Thank you. Um, next is a report from the executive director, and Rick Bishop is uh, not here today, but very uh, aptly, Barbara Spoonauer will give us an executive director report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to start us off, we have uh, we will be at Lake Elsinore uh, Storm uh, June 7th uh, for our oil uh, giveaway awareness program. Uh, if you are interested uh, in attending, we do have a handful of tickets, so if you could please see staff, I will be happy to give those to you. Uh, next, we have an update on our streetlight program, Retrofit. Uh, this is an updated uh, map from this morning showing the city of Marietta's uh, retrofit. They're about 70% complete. Uh, city of Moreno Valley is about 50% complete with their retrofit. Exciting news, city of Eastvale is going to start their retrofitting tomorrow. Um, and the remaining jurisdictions are in various processes of selecting and purchasing their LED lights so that they can get on uh, in track for uh, retrofit. I also want to make everybody aware, uh, again, General Assembly will be Thursday, June, 20, June 20th. Uh, we've extended the event to a full day conference that starts with the Future of Cities Symposium, uh, which starts at 10. Uh, like in prior years, WR COGS offering its executive committee members complimentary uh, hotel room for the night of June 20th uh, for members attending the General Assembly dinner and the executive committee the following morning. Uh, this year, WR COGS also offering its executive committee members the opportunity to stay Wednesday night if they're attending the Future of Cities uh, Symposium on Thursday morning. Uh, if you have any questions or would like uh, to confirm your hotel reservations, please get in touch with uh, Cynthia Mejia, uh, WRCOG staff, um, and we look forward to seeing everybody at this year's General Assembly at Pachanga, and we're looking forward to another successful event. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, general announcements from members. Seeing none, our next meeting, again, will be Friday after General Assembly, June 21st at 10 in the morning, and we are adjourned. Thank you.